we're going to start with uh, Dr. Barbara Turner and chronic pain and uh, move through uh, Dr. Denise Dom, Dr. Cassiano, Elizabeth Cassiano, and Dr. Sandra Oswald. And they're each going to give their presentation. And then they're going to um, join us up front and we'll have an opportunity for question and answers after their presentation. So to get us started, Dr. Turner. Thanks, All right, gonna... Thanks very much. Um, 10 minutes is going to fly by, but I want to apologize for those of you who've already heard this talk. I actually have an hour version of this, so <laughs> count yourselves lucky, I suppose. So um, I'm talking about chronic pain, uh, and it's not the most upbeat of topics, and yet it's extraordinarily relevant. Um, most of us don't really think about it, but the definition is that it lasts at least three to six months. Um, it disrupts what you do pretty much on a daily basis, but often sleep is the harbinger of chronic pain. And uh, it doesn't really have to be con constant. So think about it as a disease in and of itself. In other words, we think of arthritis and you know, low back pain, et cetera. But really, pain becomes its own problem. And it has uh, now been designated as a disease that causes changes in nerves. And the thing is, it's very hard to treat. So um, it got the attention of national experts in the Institute of Medicine. They wrote a treatise on this to raise awareness as a national priority. So I want to summarize a couple of their points, which is that one in three Americans will experience chronic pain at some point. So it's very common. And when it starts, it lasts. In other words, in older folks, when they start to get pain, 60% have it a year later. Um, so it is really common. <laughs> if you look at the diseases that we focus on as being our big health priorities here, chronic pain outstrips them all in terms of prevalence. And yet the community awareness is like um, completely less than the other ones. Um, and it even affects our um, Hollywood stars. <laughs> uh, so no one is spared really. Uh, so what does it do to your lifestyle? Um, it affects all of those aspects. For example, in sleep, about 20% of adults um, describe in a response in a national survey that they have pain at least a couple of nights a week. Uh, and that's 42 million people. Um, other health effects are um, overall compromising your health. So you report fair or poor health, and almost a third. Uh, problems with work, problems, as I mentioned, not only with quality but duration of sleep. Um, and mental effects. And as a result, it actually has a really enormous economic implication for the country, not only in direct medical expenses, but in work days lost and lost productivity. <clears throat> so why <clears throat> are women particularly the target of my uh, talk about pain? Well, that's because it's probably worse. In other words, um, at the age of about 45, uh, women are just about the same as men in terms of having arthritis. But then, as they reach into their 50s and 60s, more women are diagnosed with physician than, than, than men um, with, with arthritis. And the same is true for joint pain. So arthritis is one thing, but is it painful? Um, and here you can see that women in the Lyme are starting about the age of 40, more likely to have joint pain than men. By the time they're over 65, they're up to almost 50% having joint pain. Um, now, you may say, well, maybe women are heavier than men. <laughs> uh, and in fact, it is true that the probability of having arthritis goes up with your weight. So if you're obese, you're up to about 30%. But um, women have more pain regardless of their weight than men do. <clears throat> and here again, same colors. You can see that here men who are obese, 31%, and this is a national survey, um, had uh, problems with pain, but 43% of women had pain, regardless of their weight. So this is kind of a funny slide, but you've probably been to the doctor's office where they say, tell me your scale, you know, how bad your pain is from 1 to 10, and I wish they'd show this picture. But... Um, <laughs> Anyways, uh, just to give you a little uh, thought about what we used to do and what we are doing with pain, back in a couple of centuries ago, 
um, we had very easy access to opium. Um, and the usual uh, ladanum user, which is a uh, combination of alcohol and opium, was a Caucasian woman. Here's the stuff. Uh, and uh, that's because men had their own substance, which is alcohol, and ready access to it, because women weren't supposed to go to bars. Um, so they went to their doctors, and they got these drugs, uh, and they got addicted. Uh, so what's happening now? Well, um, opioid prescriptions are just exploding. Back in 1991, <clears throat> there were 76 million. Um, a couple of years ago, 219 million. The CDC estimates that there's enough of, of these narcotics out there to treat every man, woman, and child for at least a month with a pretty heavy dose. So we have massive amounts of these drugs around, um, and that's because a lot of people with these common conditions um, are treated with pain medication up to about um, a quarter of adults uh, get prescription pain medicines. Uh, and when you look at it for, um, by um, age and gender, women are significantly more likely to get these medications than men. Um, really striking in the 20s with only 10% of men and 22% of women. The difference is narrow, but still women are more likely to get pain medicine for their joint pain. And remember, we're more likely to have joint pain. So that um, what we found actually in our analysis here in Texas uh, is that 46% of uh, women with diabetes who had, um, received, uh, had received one of these more potent narcotics uh, compared to 38% of men. So uh, we're definitely um, in the crosshairs of getting these drugs. Um, and when we um, are, the women who are on these drugs have a lot of mental health issues compared to men on these drugs too. Um, depression, anxiety. Uh, in other words, there are a lot of downsides to narcotics. Uh, and some of them are death. Uh, so you can see here, this is the proportion of deaths per 100,000 going up through 2006. And this is the sales of these drugs. It's pretty much collinear. So um, not only do we have deaths from these drugs, uh, but it really is specifically opioids, narcotics. Here, these are deaths from different classes of drugs down here, like benzodiazepines are like Valium, um, heroin. The deaths are down here to all the other drugs. This is the narcotics in women. And over here, emergency room visits, narcotics are up there, most common cause along with the Valium type drugs. So, what do we do? I mean, this is sort of a very negative <laughs> problem. Uh, but there really are things that we should be thinking about in a prevention mode. Um, and it has to do with your everyday lifestyle. Uh, to try to avoid getting caught in this uh, problem of what to do about pain is try to prevent it. And here, um, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that when you're managing it, don't just take pain pills. It's much more complicated than that. And it requires, these are all evidence-based things to do, but when I have patients who come in and I say, so what else are you doing besides taking, you know, hydrocodone for your pain, they go, huh? So it really has to have um, a multidisciplinary approach. Whoops. Or that one, I suppose, would be another <laughs> option. Um, and really trying to stay away from those things. They're not a panacea surgery. Um, or injections, as you know, there was a terrible, a uh, lot of people who had um, fungal infections from these spinal injections. So the prevention goals are the CDCs. <clears throat> and um, I, I don't know about you, but uh, they say vigorous walking, um, 150 minutes a week. Um, if you're more active, vigorous, um, like running, jogging, 75 minutes. The thing that I fall down on, and I don't know you, is the muscle strengthening exercises. And they want us to work out all of our muscle groups um, at least a couple of days a week. Uh, but the whole package is to prepare your body um, to function better uh, and to avoid this trap of chronic pain. And you can do it at home. It actually doesn't require dragging yourself into a gym 
Uh, there are lots of these things. I find, you know, television, music, et cetera, um, are all, and heavy gardening, uh, but not this time of the year, uh, are all, uh, shoveling, <laughs> are all options for you to start to use your body. So here's the rewards. Endorphins, as you probably have heard, are feel-good hormones. You're a role model as a mom, and your kids start to exercise, um, and you live longer. And this is kind of scary data from the UK, where they looked at how good your physical activity is in age 53, like standing from a chair or walking a certain amount of time, and it was uh, highly predictive of how, whether you would be alive at age 66, about two times more likely to die if your exercise tolerance was compared to excellent, very good, good, or poor, and man, if you're in poor shape, you're almost four times more likely to be dead at the time of the age of 66. So take charge and avoid this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I'm going to be talking about dementia, which, um, just like Dr. Turner mentioned, is not a really upbeat topic, but probably relevant. I just wanted to ask how many of you are currently caring for someone with dementia here in the audience? Okay, so it's already touched the lives of several of you, and a lot of people that I run into are also really worried about themselves. So that's what I thought we'd talk about today. When should I be concerned about myself or a loved one? I'm just going to define dementia, talk a little bit about the epidemiology. How do you tell what's dementia, what's normal aging? Um, and then we'll do some question and answer. Uh, so as a physician, I don't diagnose dementia until I see two things, memory loss and uh, another cognitive difficulty that affects daily life. And so that's going to be kind of the common refrain. When you want to know if something's rising to the level of dementia or a memory problem of concern, what we will always look at is how is it affecting daily life. So when folks come into my office, I evaluate their memory, and then I ask about these things here, disorientation, which is confusion about time and place, uh, disturbance in executive function. Those of you who visited with me know um, a little bit about what executive function is, but it's those things that require some planning uh, and forethought to execute. So making change in a restaurant without using a calculator, uh, looking at a map um, and negotiating a, a path while driving um, are examples of executive function tasks. And then there's the A words, uh, aphasia, apraxia, agnosia. So those are basically difficulty doing tasks that were previously learned, difficulty recognizing familiar people or objects, um, and then aphasia is difficulty speaking. Um, problems with activities in daily living. And so there are um, activities of daily living are the things we do first to get up and get out of bed. So we get out of bed, we get dressed, we go to the bathroom, we shower. And then there are the things we do out in the world. So we drive, we go to the store, we take care of our bills, we manage our medications, um, we use the telephone, the computer. Those are um, both uh, different examples of activities of daily living. And then the last domain we'll look at is one's ability to attend or focus uh, and concentrate. But the bottom line is, um, we diagnose dementia when thinking has become so impaired it affects your ability to do daily life. Um, so I'll have, you know, folks come into my office um, and they might be really concerned about their memory, their testing might not be quite right, but when we look at their, their daily life day by day, they really haven't lost any ability to function. Um, and so we don't really call that dementia. On the other hand, I'll have folks who don't really perceive any problem at all. Um, their family may perceive quite a problem, and when we look at their daily function, they've actually given up quite a bit of what they used to do, and that is concerning for dementia. And again, I'll show the scary graphs about prevalence of things going up, but we all know there are probably about 5 million folks living with Alzheimer's disease today in America, and that's just projected to increase as baby boomers age um, until we have over 14 million people uh, in, in uh, 2050. And I had several great questions about this already. Dementia is sort of the umbrella term that we use for any progressive cognitive decline disorder. Um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common uh, type of dementia. 
And that's going to be um, what most people, you know, the only way we definitively know what type of dementia somebody had is to do a brain autopsy, and very, very few people will actually go through that. Um, but we, we know today that probably most people have uh, Alzheimer's disease. Second most common cause for a long time has been vascular dementia, which is caused by many strokes or uh, repeated small strokes over time. But there's a third type called Lewy body dementia, um, which is, there we go. Uh, which is rapidly overtaking vascular dementia. It made the news lately because they think that Robin Williams might have um, recently been diagnosed with Lewy body dementia and that might have contributed to his um, suicide. However, um, Lewy body dementia is a little bit of a different animal than um, Alzheimer's disease and uh, vascular dementia. Um, and as I said, it's rapidly um, surpassing uh, vascular dementia as the second most common cause. So anyway, a lot of people will throw, kind of interchange these terms, but dementia is sort of the umbrella. And then under it, we have Alzheimer's disease, vascular, and Lewy body. Okay, but this is probably the most common question I get is, well, how do I know if it's dementia or if it's normal aging? If you ask 160-year-olds, about half of them are going to tell you they think they've got a problem with their memory, and certainly not all of them have dementia. So some normal changes with aging are absent-mindedness. So walking into the living room and forgetting, what did I come in here for? Misplacing your keys. I mean, you know, I do that like at least once a week. So um, the thing is, is there's not a persistent pattern of these things happening more and more frequently over time, and it's not interfering with my ability to function. Eventually, I do find them and I get to work. Um, <laughs> transience is um, the ability to forget details over time, okay? And so all of us, you know, if you ask me about a party that I went to yesterday, I'm going to remember quite a few details about that. If you ask me about it again in a month, I'm not going to remember as many details about the party. I might get the date a little bit. You know, I might say it was, you know, Friday the 18th, Friday the 17th instead of Friday the 18th because I forget the date. That kind of thing is not necessarily abnormal. Um, blocking or word finding difficulty is really, really common with aging. And again, if it doesn't affect your ability to daily function, and if you eventually come up with the right answer, that's normal. What I mean by that is somebody says, you know, um, what was the name, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, thing, you, uh, you use it to dry lettuce, um, it goes around and it's a salad spinner, you know, you just can't think of the word of the thing. So that is not necessarily abnormal, okay? Um, slightly slower processing speed, okay? So that is not necessarily abnormal with aging. So you get to the right answer, it may just take you a little bit more time, a little bit more deliberation. And new learning is thought to be slower, but does occur. So you get a new computer, it takes a little bit longer to master all the bells and whistles than it would have you know, five or 10 years ago. I just want to say there's one bright note about, um, about memory and cognition with aging is that folks in their 50s and 60s are often shown um, to have a better ability to synthesize information so that when they look at high level exec female executives, uh, physicians, professionals, they're often much more skilled than their younger colleagues at like, coming into a situation and immediately kind of knowing what's going on and how to handle it. So there is a bright, there is a bright spot. <laughs> um, so it's all that to like all the like 25 year olds, you know, that are so, um, but when do you need to be concerned about your mom or dad or about yourself? You know, uh, you wanna, again, probably number one, two and three is memory loss that affects daily life, okay? So um, you always did your taxes yourself um, this year, you sat down to do it, and it just kind of seemed overwhelming, or you just couldn't get, get through it. Uh, trouble planning and problem solving. Like I mentioned, that's executive function. So um, more difficulty or more struggle with that. Difficulty completing familiar tasks. So I've had you know, some patients that are retired professors, and their, their tip-off was that you know, for fun, they used to go and do physics problems, and now it takes them you know, an hour and a half to do a problem they used to do in you know, 20 minutes. Again, disorientation, which is confusion with time or place. We're all going to mix up dates occasionally of appointments, but it's something that's a recurring pattern. New problems with vision or spatial relations. That's an interesting, uh, not altogether common, but sometimes a presenting uh, feature of dementia or Alzheimer's, that folks um, report new difficulty with vision that's not necessarily related to an eye problem or their spatial relations, so more difficulty judging, time, or, uh, judging distance in space. A new problem with speaking or writing, again, this um, is not altogether common, but can be. So per, uh, 
One gets less fluent with their language, may use simpler words, simpler sentence construction, um, and their writing might change. It might just become more simple. And probably the best um, example I can recall of this, there was a really famous physician, uh, a famous uh, writer in Britain. Um, she had a movie made about her called Iris I don't know, with Judy Dench. I don't know if anybody saw that movie. But um, she, anyway, one of the ways they diagnosed her with dementia is they compared her early writings to her later writings. And her sentence structure and everything was much more simplistic. So she was still publishing, and yet she had um, signs of dementia. Um, now, misplacing things more frequently. OK, so this is, again, we're all going to you know, lose our glasses, lose our keys, so forth. But um, again, getting to the point where it's interfering with your ability to function at home or at work. Trouble with judgment or decision making. So for your parents, this is the, oh, you know, the nice man called last week and wanted, you know, they wanted help with the fireman's fund, and so I wrote them a check for $6,000. You know, spending that's really out of character and doesn't really track with the previous. Now, I mean, if that's something they would have always done, that's one thing. But um, uh, difficulty with those with uh, judgment and decision making, social withdrawal is a really common one. Okay, because often folks know there's a, a change in memory. They kind of see the slippage, and they don't want to be around other people who might pick up on that or notice that. Or it's just too effortful. It's just, it takes a lot of work to participate in the conversation and try to work so hard to remember and to try to seem, quote, normal. Um, so a lot of folks will just kind of withdraw. And, um, so really common presenting signs for me is, you know, my mom really took pride in leading the Bible study at her church, and she just hasn't wanted to go the last, you know, few months. Or she used to sing in the choir, and um, for some reason, she did. She, you know, she said it was the practice was too late at night. But you know, anyway, as we dig deeper, we kind of realize it may have been the memory. Um, and then change in mood or personality. Uh, so again, um, depression may often be one presenting sign. It can also complicate the diagnosis of dementia. But um, but folks, again, as they realize memory is changing, may uh, show the change in mood or personality, such as being a little more irritable, sometimes more paranoid, suspicious. Um, and so all of those things would be, would be signs. And so I have this um, tool at my booth, but uh, you can also look on the Alzheimer's website. These are the top 10 warning signs or uh, signs to be concerned about dementia. And this is if you ask folks who have early dementia what it feels like. They often feel perplexed, kind of fuzzy, foggy, unsure of themselves. They lose confidence. They're not, they don't feel they can trust their brain anymore or their, uh, their trusty uh, tool. They're fearful of making mistakes. Uh, they feel a lot of frustration. They have a lot more trouble multitasking. So now they have to do one thing and then move on to the next. Uh, familiar things become challenging. And as you can imagine, that's just really tough to deal with. Uh, and unfortunately, in the early stages, most folks with Alzheimer's disease realize this is happening. And it's often the most painful and, and difficult stage for them. The difficult stage for you as a caregiver will be later. Um, but for them, this early part is the most challenging. Uh, they may initially try to write it off as, quote, old age. Um, and, you know, for a lot of them, when their parents were aging, they may have had signs of dementia. We didn't really diagnose and, you know, do much about dementia um, uh, until lately. So they may say, I don't know why you're making all this fuss about me. Um, and as I said, the realization something's wrong is just extremely painful. And often folks will say, you know, I'm just afraid of losing my mind. I've, I think I heard that quote twice at my booth today, although everyone has screened normally so far. So <laughs> it's a really big, scary thing. Um, and often how folks are going to go through this process depends a lot on their current activity level, their, uh, what they, their occupation, and how much support they have, and how much embeddedness they have in a community. All right, so if you are worried about yourself or worried about a loved one, I think your first step is to talk to your primary doctor. Make an appointment for yourself. Make an appointment for your loved one. And educate yourself. I can't say enough positive things about the Alzheimer's Association. That's where I get all my materials. And everything they have is public domain, so you can Xerox it to your heart's content. Um, and then reach out to others, friends and family who might have dealt with this. They're honestly going to be your best practical resource. The doctor makes the diagnosis, but your friend whose mom had dementia is going to be the best person to know, what do I do at 2 AM when my mom wakes up and she you know, is trying to get dressed for work, and um, how do I handle those kind of things? Uh, because caregiver support networks are just absolutely vital if you're caring for someone. And when you, go to the doc when you or your loved one goes to the doctor, they'll do a history, physical. They'll ask about those functional things I mentioned. Um, they'll do some lab testing. And they may or may not do imaging of the brain if the person's younger than 65. Things have seemed to come on really quickly. 
or really suddenly. And then, again, not to be such a Debbie Downer, what can we do to prevent dementia? The two most uh, important things are to exercise your mind, which we all might think is logical. So it doesn't have to be crosswords or Sudoku. It can just you know, be anything that you enjoy. Crocheting, um, uh, working is a great way to continue exercising your mind. Um, anything that's beyond sitting and watching TV or just sitting by yourself in a chair. Okay, so talking to others. Anything that actively engages the brain counts. And then to exercise your body. Exercising is probably just as good, if not better, than the medications that we have to treat dementia. And that's just, you know, it's going to be the broken record that you'll hear. Um, I went to a three-day meeting in geriatrics, and for every problem from diabetes to arthritis to dementia to osteoporosis, exercise is sort of the elixir of life. Um, if you have chronic conditions, manage those, um, high blood pressure, diabetes, depression, and, you know, eat healthy. So if you do that, uh, uh, but those are really the, the most tried and true uh, things that we can do to prevent dementia. Um, so there's just a brief uh, summary of what we talked about. I'm doing on time. And then I'll be happy to take any questions um, at the end. Thank you very much. We're going to talk about incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. Um, I just have some pictures. It's always nice to orient people with normal anatomy here um, just to get an idea of what it is that's coming down. Um, and then I have some pictures here of what could be coming down. Um, so these are all things that, you know, it's a embarrassing to talk about, but I talk about it because it is important and because it happens so often. Um, why do they occur? There's basically been a weakening of the ligaments and strong tissues that hold everything up. So pelvic organs are able to fall down. People, most people are familiar with hernias. It's the same idea, except in the vaginal area instead of in the abdomen where most people's hernias occur. Um, we know there's an association with these pelvic floor disorders with age, pregnancies and deliveries, loss of estrogen, doing activities over time, things like chronic cough, chronic straining, uh, heavy lifting for long periods of time. And for most women, these are things that all have experienced at some point or another, one or more of these things. There's also a genetic component, so a lot of people say the same thing. My mom had a hysterectomy for the same reason. That's really common. And that's going to be even more important for women, younger women with the prolapse. As you get older, it's probably more environmental factors, but there is still some genetics in uh, having to do with it. So there was a big study in Salt Lake City where they do a lot of genetic studies, and they did find several areas that are associated with it. So it definitely does run in families. And the twin studies have shown the same thing. Very common again. I have a lot of women who come into my office and say, you know, yes, this has been happening. And most women think, you know, yes, it's happening. It may or may not need treatment. And that's true. We'll talk about that as well. But it is very common. So ranging from, I've seen prevalence rates anywhere between 25 and 65 percent with stress incontinence, same 20 to 55 percent of women. So this is a lot of women this is happening to. When they looked at a nursing home study, 31.8 percent had urinary incontinence alone. 40% had both urinary incontinence and fecal incontinence, and those all, a lot of those go hand in hand. Uh, severe incontinence has a lower prevalence in young women. Um, they do have it, but that seems to be more commonly severe as you get to ages 70 to 80. Um, one study looking at 497 women found the mean age of these problems and symptoms to be at about age 44. And again, it's important because it affects the quality of life. And I tell patients, you know, this is, this is important not because it's something that's going to kill you, like some of the other things that we've talked about today, but it's a quality of life issue. Um, affects daily activities, sexual function, exercise, has a detrimental effect on their uh, body image and sexuality. They looked at one nursing home study and they looked at quality of life measures and they have found that measures of mood and dignity and autonomy were affected. And it's actually a reason why women can get it. Uh, put into nursing homes. That one of those things that caregivers, you know, they've, they've been doing all these things for women and it's kind of the, all those things that come in common. They say, okay, I've had it, it's time to go to a nursing home. Um, treatment requires significant resources. Uh, annual cost of care for pelvic floor disorders in the United States from 2005 to 2006 was almost $300 million. So this is a huge problem. And again, as similar to some of the other programs, as the baby boomers age, this is going to be even more common. 
What symptoms do they have? It can be any variety of symptoms. And some women have no symptoms at all, so that's the other important thing to remember. It might be diagnosed on an annual exam. They may not even notice, and that's okay. It doesn't necessarily have to have symptoms to go along with it. But what you might notice is bulge or pressure, difficulty emptying the bowel or bladder. You can have recurrent infections, bleeding, or inability to have intercourse. And some of the, those are the, some of the reasons people will present to my office. Types of incontinence, the first three are the most common. The stress incontinence, that's the coughing, laughing, sneezing, lift a heavy box. This is probably the most common in young women and the most common, most co common type of incontinence that women live with for 10 years, 15 years, and don't do anything about. Um, urge incontinence, so you get an urge deal, you can't defer it. It's probably something you've heard on TV a lot, the gotta go, gotta go medications, that goes with the urge incontinence. And the third one's the other most common, and that's the combination of the first two, and that's probably what most women have. They have some sort of combination of the stress and urge. There's also overflow incontinence. We see that a lot, um, I think, in San Antonio, especially with our high diabetes population. You can get a lot of neuropathy, that bladder's not working as well as it should, and some of that's also going to go along with aging. So you're leaking because you're not emptying completely, and you have overflow. There's just, it's leaking on its own because you're not emptying fully. Or the functional incontinence, um, basically in unable to get to the toilet due to functional reasons or cognitive impairment. Or you had a reasonable amount of time to get there, but you're, you're in a wheelchair or walker, whatever it is, you're just not getting there on time. Treatments for prolapse, again, if it's not bothering you, doing nothing and reassurance is often a, a reason people come in. They come in because they felt something, they thought it was a mass, they thought maybe it was cancer. Um, it's something enough for people just to say, yep, that's okay, you know, we have stages of prolapse and talk to them about the stage and things you can do to prevent. Vaginal estrogen and Kegel exercises kind of go in that, where it's not necessarily doing nothing, but you're trying to prevent future prolapse and actually help symptoms better. So it's not going to get it back to before you had children for when you were 18. It's not going to go back all the way, but it's going to get to a point where it's not bothering you. Pessaries, which I have a picture of, it's a little rubber-like device that holds everything up. The nice thing about this is it avoids surgical options. Um, it's something you get fit for in the clinic. Very easy to take care of yourself. Uh, and then there is surgery. So here's a picture of a pessary. In this picture, the one that's in place is the one that you can also use for stress incontinence in addition to prolapse. And basically different shapes and sizes. It's a fitting visit that you come into the office for. We try the different shapes and sizes depending on what's falling down. And then teach you how to use it. Best case scenario is somebody's taking it in and out themselves once or twice a week. Um, but I do have some women who can't do it themselves and they can come into our office and do that as well. Surgical repair is very common um, for patients who either don't get benefited by the pessary or take a look at that and say, there's no way I'm doing that, which you do have a lot of women who say that as well. Um, surgery is a great option, um, and that's for prolapse and incontinence. So approximately 200,000 women undergo surgery for prolapse. Another 135 have surgery for stress incontinence annually in the United States. So it is very common. Unfortunately, 30% of these are going to need repeat surgery, um, but of course the good way to look at that is 70% of women are good for the rest of their lives and they have the one surgery and they're happy. Um, but it is again very common, so it's the most common inpatient procedure performed in women older than 70 from 1979 to 2006. How do we treat stress incontinence? So those Kegels, again, go back to exercise. Um, this is a little bit different exercise than we might have been talking about, but Kegel exercise is good for all sorts of things. It's going to help your prolapse, stress incontinence, and urge incontinence. The pessary, the picture I showed you there, and then I've got a picture of the next three. Um, these are uh, this first picture. Let's see. Here we've got uh, slings. Um, up here it's a bulking agent, so you're actually injecting in something through a scope, a cystoscope, into the urethra to close off that opening. And then this is a little device, kind of similar to a pessary, except it goes into the urethra. And it's really good for just very temporary stress incontinence. So I have, I'm fine, except I can't, I'm not going to the gym anymore, because for that hour, I can't do exercise. This is a great option for women like that. Um, because it, again, voids surgery. It's something we fit you for in the office and something you take care of on a daily basis. Finally, treatment of urge incontinence. So again, Kegels, this is going to be message of the day. Kegels help everything. Um, avoiding things that irritate the bladder, caffeine, carbonation, citrus fruits. And again, this goes back to quality of life. I'm not saying taking all the things out of your diet that you enjoy. If your cup of coffee in the morning is your most important thing, by all means, go for it. But if you're somebody who's on your third or fourth or fifth cup of coffee by the end of the day, that might be something to look at and say, okay, if I cut back, do I feel better? Does my bladder feel better? There's plenty of women who can have five cups of coffee and their bladder's just fine. And that's, that's you. That's great. There's no reason to stop it. 
but it's something to look at your diet and see what you're doing. Making sure you're going often enough or for women who are going too often, learning how to suppress that. So I try to again go to, can you complete an activity? Can you sit through a two hour movie? You don't have to go if you don't want to. That should be something that everyone should have the goal for doing. Medications, anticholinergic medicines, and then I have some pictures of the next two, the Botox and sacral modulation. Anticholinergics are the ones, again, you've seen on TV, um, increasing bladder capacity by blocking some of the receptors in the bladder so that detrusor muscle that squeezes when you don't want it to, when it's not full, we're going to relax that muscle. And it's at a point where it's relaxing it some. It's not going to relax it all the way that you don't empty, but it's enough that you can have that. So the goal is to decrease the number of voids and the number of leaks. Unfortunately, there are some side effects, uh, dry mouth, constipation, and some of them have some effects on memory um, and cognition. So if that's an issue, that's something that we'll talk about before starting medications. And there is very few contraindications. Basically, the only one is, uh, the only big one that we see is if you have uncontrolled glaucoma. This is a picture of Botox. This is something that's done in the office. Um, similar to what you would do Botox for, uh, for wrinkles, you're basically relaxing a big muscle. So you're injecting into the bladder wall itself, and the goal is to try to get to that point where it's relaxed enough that you're not leaking, but not so much that you're not able to go. Um, so that's where you're trying to balance those. This is a great little device. Um, it's called Interstim. It's good for an overactive bladder. This Botox and, over, and sacral neuromodulation are good for patients who have failed the usual therapy. So you've tried the, the take, taking the coffee out, you've tried the medications, tried the physical therapy, that's not working for you. Um, so the next step would be this. Um, the same company that makes the pacemaker for the heart makes the pacemaker for the bladder. Um, and this is a nice option because it's very, there's nothing you have to do to it. Once it's implanted, you're good to go. You don't have to do something every day. You're not changing any settings, but it basically sends a little impulse into your spine. It gets implanted there and you have a little battery pack that sits in the upper buttock. Um, it's good for stress, I'm sorry, good for urge incontinence, good for women who don't empty all the way for people who have retention. It's now also FDA approved for fecal incontinence and they're working on it for constipation. So it gets a lot of bang for your buck um, and it's really great for, again, not having to worry about doing something on a regular basis. Very few side effects and really the only big contraindication are women who need to get MRIs. Um, it's a battery, so they haven't made it MRI compatible yet. And there's an outpatient version of the same therapy, except you go through your ankle, through the tibial nerve, up to the same place that you end up with that, the other leads, so it should go into your back. Um, but it's just a little bit more um, to do. Basically, it's 12, 30-minute sessions that you do in the clinic. And then from there, there's some maintenance. Um, but it's really good for those women who cannot get the, who need MRIs or who don't want the implant for some reason, who are scared to have something implanted in there. Um, but it also, again, it's just a little bit more time intensive in terms of having to come into the office. Unfortunately, they haven't made an outpatient one to take to your house yet, but maybe that's the next step. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. Now I know I have a lot to look forward to. <laughs> so here I go with another happy talk. But uh, we're going to talk about skin cancer and skin cancer prevention. And one of the things I like to do when I give these talks is to help people understand what skin cancer looks like and who's at risk and then what kind of things can you do to prevent it. Because out of all the different cancers in the world, skin cancer is one that is the most preventable. So we're going to start with our objectives, which is to wear, raise awareness, to recognize or at least identify some worrisome lesions, and then we're going to look at the risk factors and then again, measures that you can do to help prevent yourself from getting skin cancer. So what is the most common cancer in people? It's actually skin cancer. Very good. And over 2 million people are diagnosed annually with skin cancer, so it's a very, very common and large problem. The Skin Cancer Foundation will say that one in every five Americans will develop skin cancer in their lifetimes. And there's many millions and millions of people who are living with a history of either non-melanoma skin cancer or with melanoma. And out of these types, we're going to start with basal cell carcinoma because that's one of the most common types of skin cancer there is. And it represents approximately 80% of all skin cancers. 
And basal cells have many different looks, and that's why I like to show these pictures. One of the most common look for a basal cell will be a very pearly, translucent lesion. And often you'll have a little ulcer or erosion in the middle. They used to call that a rodent ulcer, a rodent bite. You know, and that used to be a signal to people that they may have had a worrisome lesion. So basal cells are very commonly pearly or translucent with a little ulcer or erosion in the center. However, it doesn't have to have an erosion. It could just be a growing lesion that's a little translucent. The other thing you might notice are these little blood vessels. And so when you have a lot of blood vessels that are torturous growing within a, a bump that's growing, you can actually see them, then you might want to be concerned and we'll go ahead and get that checked. Now, this is a type of basal cell that you all might not recognize, and, and many doctors don't recognize it either. It can look like a plaque of eczema, okay? This is a superficial type of basal cell that spreads slowly, but it starts as just like a red plaque, a red growth, and it, it can or cannot be itchy, but it can scale. And this is the kind that often grows larger and larger before it's realized. Or sometimes they'll come to me having treated it with multiple steroids and it's not getting better. And then I'll look at it and say, well, you know what? It may be time to do a little biopsy because maybe this is not what we think it is. So I like to bring attention to this type of superficial basal cell that can look like uh, chronic uh, dermatitis or rash. Some basal cells can look like scars. So I just want to bring this up in that sometimes you'll have a, what looks like a scar growing on the face but no history of previous injury or trauma. And so new scars is actually something to consider and might be dangerous. So something that you might want to be checked for. And then I want to mention that some can also look like melanoma. Some basal cells can actually be what we call pigmented or brown in coloration. And so you might think this is bad, but you might think it's a melanoma, where it's actually a basal cell. In this case, I don't mind as long as you recognize it's a growing lesion that's brown, because you're going to come in to get it checked. But I just want to um, bring attention to the fact that basal cells can actually be brown also. Now, basal cells are actually one of the better skin cancers to have because they tend to stay in their place and grow slowly. You don't tend to metastasize to other places like some of the skin cancers we're going to talk about today. But why do we worry about it? Well, because it can grow gradually, gradually, but then become big enough where it can metastasize or can cause significant destruction to surrounding structures, like it's by your nose or by your eye. You know? So you don't want to wait until it's this big. You see this one has a lot of the features I told you about, translucency. It has those dilated, uh, ugly-looking vessels and a big ulcer in the center. Now, this one has been there for a while. And you'd be surprised how big Sometimes, you know, I'll see them. You think, why don't you come earlier? Well, there's a lot of reasons why people won't want to come in, right? There's a lot of denial. You know, I don't want to know what it is. It's like, maybe it'll go away. Oh, it's a spider bite. You know, I hear that all the time. It's just, I got bit by a spider. And I go, what's a spider doing in everybody's houses? I don't really understand. <laughs> I always get this history. And, I, and I, I say, did you see it? No, I didn't see it, but it must be. And I said, well, you know, in, um, they wait. You know, the weight doesn't get better. They ask their friends and family. They put antibiotics on it. They put salves on it. They do all sorts of things. And then, but ultimately, there's a little bit of fear, you know? And, and that's something I want to tell you guys about. Don't wait. Don't be fearful. The earlier you catch these things, the better it is, OK? We can take care of it a lot easier when it's smaller. OK, so what are the risk factors? Of course, sun. Sun exposure is the primary risk factor for all types of skin cancer, basal cell included, both UVB and UVA wavelengths cause problems. And it's on the areas where you get a lot of sun, the head, right, the face, the nose, the ears. OK, it's one of my one of the people help remind me to tell you that. And uh, so you want to look carefully in those areas, but also think about the hands or other areas. And basal cells don't have to be limited to sun-exposed areas. It could be also in covered areas. And those at higher risk are those with a family history of skin color. If you have fair eyes, um, like you mean blue eyes, light, light uh, skin, um, if you're easy to burn or tan. Um, if you have a previous history of skin cancer, you're, you have increased risk. If you've had radiation to your skin, that does give you increased risk for skin cancer in that area. And if you've been, um, had a transplant, or been, you're on chronic immunosuppression, HIV, all those things, and your immune system is down, increases your risk for skin cancer. Let's talk about the next type. Squamous cell carcinoma can occur anywhere, again, more frequently on sun-exposed areas. And it has a little bit more metastatic potential, a little bit more serious in terms of the type of skin cancer. And these look a little different. They often are just a rough, scaly layer area, 
pink area that has a little bit of scale growing. You don't know why. Why is it growing scale? The skin is always making scale, but it's sloughing off imperceptibly. But instead, you get a spot that's growing scale repeatedly. It can be as a big, thick bump with a lot of scale and keratin, or we call it keratin debris, but a lot of uh, crust in the middle. You have to be very careful about persistent uh, sores on the lip, you know, because these are a little more aggressive in terms of squamous cells. So if you have someone who has a scaling spot that keeps scaling on the lip or a sore that's not, not viral, you know, it's persistent, you might want to get it checked out. I know a lot of you are feeling your lips right now. <laughs> I noticed immediately. Um, but this is something we see commonly because it'll start off as little scaly areas, okay? Ears, okay? And uh, we were just talking about this outside, is that a lot of people wear ball caps, right? And they think, you know, in Texas, they're always wearing a ball cap. Well, what does that not protect? Your ears, you know? Your ears are hanging out there. So make sure, and we're going to talk about that, protecting your ears because they're actually more aggressive when they develop on the ears. If you have a chronic wound, actually that does increase your risk for this particular type of skin cancer. So people are diabetic and have a lot of ulcers on their legs. I always pay attention to that, make sure it's healing. If there's a non-healing area or area that grows within that ulceration, I might want to biopsy and make sure it's not developing a secondary skin cancer within that wound. All right, what are these actinic keratoses? Have, you don't have to raise your hand, but a lot of people have these actinic keratoses with these scaly growths and um, we want to treat them. Why? Well, because most of us believe that they're very early skin cancers, early squamous cells. Some, you know, sometimes you'll hear precancerous lesion. They're very early. If you leave them alone, a certain percentage of them will develop into more um, invasive squamous cell carcinomas. So scaly areas, you may see that on you know, elderly people's hands and arms, a lot of scaly spots that just keep regrowing. So who's at risk? Similarly to basal cell, you're older, you have fair skin, um, light eyes, uh, you sunburn easy, you had a history of skin cancer, or maybe a family history of skin cancer. That increases your risk. And then I already mentioned radiation and chronic immunosuppression, um, even more so for squamous cells are people with transplant patients. You know, transplant patients who are immunosuppressed can have that. Um, there's also one that I will add, human papillomavirus. That's a virus that causes common warts. Um, people have genital warts or, um, or persistent long-standing warts. You can actually develop skin cancer from having chronic wart um, infection. So what do we do? Again, I want to reemphasize, if you get a new or changing growing lesion, don't wait. Don't wait. Don't worry. It's actually, actually um, the earlier I can get to it, the better it will be for you. If the lesion does not heal or bleeds, um, go ahead and get evaluated. Don't just get one, get them serially. You know, get your regular follow-ups um, because it's very important, like I say, the earlier the better. Now we're gonna move on to the worst skin cancer that we have and follow is melanoma, okay? So melanoma, I just have to let you know, is increasing in incidence as we speak. It does increase. The mortality has, sort of, has been increasing, but now it's almost stabilized but the increased incidence of melanoma has been occurring throughout the years, even to today. And melanoma is not the most common, but it's the most deadly skin cancer we see. It represents maybe five to 10% of skin cancers. It's the sixth most common cancer in the US. And look at this, the most common cancer among 25 to 29 year olds. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later. And melanomas can develop in existing moles. Nevi means mole or it can arise new. Okay, we call it de novo, when it rises newly on the skin. There's actually a lot of information on melanomas now. The multiple pathways, multiple genetic abnormalities, and this has become very important for treatment. If you're interested, we could talk about that more a little bit later. But for instance, BRAF is a very common mutation, and now we actually have some medication that targets that particular mutation. So early detection is the key to survival for melanoma, as is for all skin cancers. And the survival rate, if you're detected early, is about 99% over five years, but it falls to maybe 15% of those with advanced melanoma. So again, earlier, the better. And I'm going to show you different kinds of melanomas because I think they also have different looks. And um, one is called the superficial spreading type, and these tend to be brown areas, brown growths that can be a little bit raised. And then we also have the nodular ones. These are ones that grow as a big like mushroom on the skin, and they grow pretty fast. And this is called a nodular melanoma. And this is probably uh, represents most of our more thicker melanomas. 
We also have something called lenticular malignant melanoma. All of you have probably some sunspots. And as you get older, you get more and more sunspots. Well, those aren't necessarily bad, but they can become bad. And I mean, they do. And these sunspots become either larger or more irregular in coloration or irregular on the edge. You see how the regular edge, regular coloration, or even little bumps within it. Those are dangerous changes that you should let your doctor know about. I want you to know that you can get them on your feet. You say, but that's not sun exposed. Well, they, they told you there's different mutations, and there's some particularly if you have skin of color, Asians, Latinos, African Americans, um, you can get a different type of melanoma that can occur on the feet or the hands or in the nail beds. And so I always, or I always try to look at feet, not because I particularly feel a need to, I want to, um, <laughs> but I, I always do, because this is one that goes unnoticed, okay? And I have seen bad melanomas on the feet or between the toes that people just didn't notice. And then I want to mention this one, which is an A melanog melanoma. That means that it's not colored or pigmented. And this is the one that goes unnoticed, that people, again, think this is something else, and they get big. Okay, so these, these um, amelanotic or non-colored melanomas often come to my office already larger than what I would like. So I bring that to your attention. All right, what are the risk factors similar to the other skin cancers we talked about? But in addition, if you have um, changing moles or lots of moles, that's a lot of atypical moles, it may increase your risk. Um, if you have large congenital moles over 20 centimeters, it might increase your risk. If you've already had a melanoma, it can increase your risk. And then these are the same things that you saw on the other slides. Light hair, light, light eyes, older, um, and uh, blistering, sun, blistering sunburns when you were little. Those do increase your risk. I do want to mention that even if you have color to your skin and have some natural protection, you're not immune to having any of these skin cancers. Okay, and as a matter of fact, because you think and you do know that your risk of skin cancer is less than maybe someone who's lighter skin, you may delay your diagnosis, right? You may come in later. And that's when I find, like again, the ones between the toes. I found one between the toes that was so big, he had to get part of his foot removed. And, and he, thought it was, he thought it was just fungus or something. You know, he just didn't want to believe that he had melanoma because he was Latino and he had never burned in his life. He never burns, you know. And so I just have to caution you, especially here in South Texas, we have strong sun, but we also have um, a lot of patients with color to their skin. And they do have um, a risk for melanoma and the other skin cancers. It may not be as much, but it's still present. Okay, so the most sensitive clinical marker is a change in a pigmented lesion or a new lesion. So what do I say? You or your significant other, this is where it's nice to have a partner who can look at your back and other areas, should perform a skin examination. I always say monthly. Of course, it's hard to do it monthly yourself, but try your best to do monthly or have an annual visit. And one way to make sure you do it is to, on your birthdays, check your birthday suit, okay? That's nice. I always think when my birthday comes around, I do everything. I get my, my skin exam, my dental, I go see my primary care doctors, and I just think it's, my, it's birthday time, it's time to go check. All right, and then uh, quickly, things that we ask of you to look for when you're looking at your moles is, is it um, asymmetric? See how this side's darker than this side? Is the border starting to get irregular? It's not smooth and round. It's more irregular. Do you have different colors? You know, if you have red, white, and blue in your melanoma, that's not good. That's, you may be patriotic, but it's not good for a changing skin lesion. And you actually can get those colors in changing melanomas. I'm not so concerned about this one, although it's just true. If it's bigger, you should pay more attention to it. But just because it's big doesn't mean it's a melanoma. But pay attention to it. This is the one that would be the most helpful for your dermatologist if you can look at an evolving or changing mole, okay? That's the most sensitive marker. If you tell me that mole's changing, I'm gonna take that very seriously, okay? Moles that are changing, getting itchy, bleeding by themselves, all not good things, right? Okay, so what are you gonna do? You're gonna seek the shade between 10 and four. Those are the high peak hours of sun exposure. Try not to burn. We don't have you cover up. You know, big broad rim hats, two, three inches. Um, they're very fashionable now. You know, you can put decorate it. Um, and you can uh, wear UV protective clothing, okay, long sleeves. They have lots of uh, companies that have UV protective clothing. Wear those big, you know, Jackie Onassis sunglasses. Just protect this whole area. It's really a nice. Um, remember, broad, uh, broad sunscreen protection, it has to say, 
broad. That's the best kind, and it won't say it unless it's true now. FDA makes it so that it has to say, um, if it is broad, then it can say it, and it can't say it if it's not. So you're lucky if it says broad, then you're good to go. At least 30, or I say now at least 50, but um, apply two tablespoons. You know, that's like a shot glass full of sunscreen. How many of you use a shot glass full on your skin? That's not a lot, right? A little pea size, that's not enough. You gotta use a lot. You gotta smear it on, you know, make sure you put on 30 minutes before they get a chance to sink in. Try and wear sunscreen protection on your lips. How many of y'all wear SPF in your lipstick? Good, or your chapstick. They have it now, why not? Use it. I see a lot of people with brown spots. They want me to remove them, get rid of them. I said, you know, you really gotta protect yourself. Okay, and keep newborns out of the sun if possible. You can use sunscreens maybe after six months. You might want to try a physical sunscreen first without chemicals. Uh, make sure they don't have reactions to it. And again, examine yourself, okay? All right, and the last thing I want to say, I hope I didn't take too much time, is to ban the tan. How many of you know somebody who's in the tanning booth? No way, just a few? Oh my goodness. So there's over a million girls in tanning booths every day. Okay, and uh, they're responsible, probably this, this, this tanning booth and such, of increasing the risk of melanoma, particularly on the backs of women. And um, I've seen younger women who has more atypical lesions now. So ban the tan, no tanning is good, no, none of that tanning booth stuff is good for anybody. So spread the word, be my advocates, tell people, don't do it, don't do it. And um, it also, <laughs> it's also protective, uh, helps you with fine wrinkling and everything. Do use sunscreen, sun protection, so do your best, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions after. The, the evidence for uh, chiropractic care outside of low back is not terrific. In other words, what we really are looking for are randomized trials, and it's kind of hard to do a placebo when you're doing these things. So, um, but I, you know, in general, I think that manipulation can be helpful. It's dangerous in your neck, though. I just want to put that plug in. Um, you have these enormous vessels that go up to your head and sometimes they get dissections when they're doing major manipulation. So I wouldn't do that. You know, what's interesting though about chiropractors, I mean, I like anybody related to one, but um, it's that they have a business model that's a little disturbing because it's pretty much see me every week and I'll take care of your physical problems. And I want to emphasize, and I think we all will, that this actually takes your being engaged and thinking about what you can do on pretty much a daily basis. How do you integrate this into your lifestyle? Because a lot you can adopt without having someone else doing something to you. Try it. <laughs> That's a good, hello. Okay, you can probably hear me anyway. So that's a really good question. She asked, what about changes in penmanship as a marker for dementia? So writing getting smaller um, is certainly a marker for Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease. Um, and sometimes we'll pick up tremor, uh, which can again be associated with Parkinson's or other types of uh, sort of more rare types of dementia. Um, I'm not familiar with any other definite signs in terms of change in handwriting. As I said, mm -hmm. right, and that may go to, um, again, changes in verbal fluency or sentence construction. 
those are things I'll look at. So somebody, um, when I do a cognitive screen in my office, one of the things I'll have somebody do is write a sentence. And I follow patients over time. So when somebody first comes to see me, they might write, um, I got up this morning and it's a beautiful day today. And then a year later when I repeat, repeat the screen, they might write, um, I am here. You know, see, again, you know, I see a change in sort of more construction type stuff. So I'm not really aware of certain definitive changes, but um, in, in the actual handwriting itself, other than, as I said, writing getting smaller um, or uh, being able to see a tremor or tremulousness in the handwriting. are um, um, some of them are the the harder thing with men um, is the prostate um, and that makes things a lot more complicated so that in terms of who's a candidate for it but yes I actually did my training with a general urologist and we did regularly put those in on men um, I don't know I would assume the the outpatient version is is good for them as well but it would just be a little bit different evaluation than what I would do in terms of making sure they're a candidate for it That's a good question. So she asked, when we do the lab evaluation for dementia, what are we actually looking for? So what we're looking for are what we call reversible or treatable causes of dementia. So they're not dementia, but they can cause a patient to look like they have dementia. Thyroid disorders such as hypo or hyperthyroidism, B12 deficiency, um, uh, temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis, a vasculitis condition uh, are um, conditions that will cause somebody to present with memory problems but don't represent dementia. So what we're looking for are things that we can treat um, to reverse or to ameliorate the dementia. So we're, we're kind of ruling other things out when we do the lab evaluation. Yes, dementia really is a diagnosis of, dis of exclusion. So we rule out all these other medical or what we call metabolic problems, vasculitic problems. Um, with lab tests, and then we feel more comfortable saying, okay, um, this is probably a dementing illness. So when you were talking about chronic pain, I noticed a lack of discussion of fibromyalgia. Is there a specific reason for that? Yeah. Um, it's within the frame <clears throat> framework of, of chronic pain. It's one of the less common ones, although it is extraordinarily disabling. It's, it's a complicated disease, as you probably are aware. But um, when I'm managing it, one of the most difficult things is with fibromyalgia, it's painful, uncomfortable to exercise. And yet, it's one of the most important things you can do. So, um, you know, I, I, it's hard to get people to do things that they find really, um, you know, uncomfortable, but the feedback once you get into it is so significant. But fibromyalgia, you know, is poorly understood um, and probably another one of these things where the nerves take on a life of their own. So um, you're right, and in 10 minutes, that's where you go to the one hour talk. <laughs> hint, hint, I'd be happy to do. Thanks. Yes. So, so there's a question about uh, trials for managing chronic pain, how much is lifestyle versus diet versus Genetics. In, in general, the trials are looking at specific um, approaches like yoga or acupuncture or chiropractic care. And you can imagine they're difficult to do. So what's the placebo for yoga? Um, you know, and, and can you really make them equivalent? But um, in, in general, the evidence is more from looking at predictors of who does well. Um, and looking in cohorts. And so we know that people who assume a more active lifestyle um, have um, lower predictors of being in chronic pain, 
you know, down the road, uh, and even more shockingly, more likely to be alive down the road. Oh, there are a lot of things that go into it. But anyways, um, so I think that it's important just to understand that it all fits together, these, these lifestyle behaviors. Um, when you think, except for my jogging out in the sun. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, so I, um, but I think that it's really important for us to be advocates for this lifestyle way beyond just avoiding diabetes and weight control. It's, it's a whole package that, that I think women are leaders in trying to promote. Sorry for the proselytizing. A question regarding sunscreen. What is the key ingredient? You know, there's so many out there, and they say 50, 75, 90, whatever. But what is the key ingredient that we should be looking for in a sunscreen that will tell us if it's, it's a product is valid? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, there's going to be a lot more ingredients coming out in the market, so um, I think that you can try to focus on those, but really the most important thing is the, is the broad spectrum um, labeling of it and, uh, and, and the SPF to some degree. So basically what I tell people with sunscreen, because there's going to be new ones on the market that tout SPF 100, SPF 120, and there's Muxoro, and, there's these, and these other ones, and, and there's gonna be, I know in the next year, a few additional ones. The most important thing for you to give you adequate protection is to just make sure it says broad, screen, broad spectrum, and it's at least 50, because if it says broad spectrum, you're covering the UVA and UVB spectrum, and they have to have a chemical profile to fit that. And if you look at the backs, it'll be composed of either physical or chemical blockers of both. And I've told some of the individuals out here that it's nice to have a combination of a physical and a chemical blocker in your sunscreen. So for, for instance, physical blockers are, are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. And to have a component of that which reflects the light and then chemical blockers to make up the rest of the spectrum is good. And that, what, what that does is it, it absorbs light. You know, it absorbs and changes the light. So you have that combination of features. But most of my people who have serious um, what we call photosensitizing conditions or conditions where they're very sensitive to the sun. I almost always have them put a physical blocker in with the, with the other chemicals. And then all those other ones, you, it doesn't really matter exactly which one as long as they forge you that broad protection. You want to, in the end, the SPF 50 um, at least is great because it absorbs most or takes care of most of the, um, the sunlight that you'll be exposed to. Um, but if you even get the 100, don't think that you're more protected necessarily, okay? So some people put the 100 and think they're good for the whole day. It's not true. Any sunscreen you put on from 50 on is going to give you the most protection, and then you need to reapply every couple of hours if you're going to be out there, because it does degrade, degrade on the skin or wear off and that kind of thing. So I hope that's helpful. Dr. Oswald. Yes. So for those of us that um, weren't always good about staying out of the sun, mm -hmm. and now we've crossed the 50 mark, Generally. <laughs> what should we be using on our face to kind of reverse those? I mean, there's all these other products out there, and what should we be looking for, and what really works, and what's really helpful to us? Mm -hmm. um, it's a very good question. So, in, in a sense, you're talking about um, how do I protect my skin from now on, and how to maybe try to reverse some of the changes that have occurred over time because of the previous sun exposure. The single most important um, product is still going to be sunscreen and sun protection. So sunscreen for your face every day. And I tell my women, you just get a regimen, you wake up, you clean your face, dry, first goes on your sunscreen. And then you can put your makeup or other products on top. Um, another um, product that's somewhat rejuvenating is going to be your retinase. And so out of, in the literature, sunscreen and retinoids, or retin an A of some sort um, probably give you the most bang for your buck in terms of um, helping to treat your fine wrinkling and such. Um, but then there's a whole slew after that of medications or um, products, antioxidants uh, that have been used to treat the fine lines around the eyes and other places. And there's a, a, a tremendous amount of a market in those kind of things. They have, uh, they're called cosmeceuticals, so there's not as much um, research actually behind those treatments. Okay, they're going to they're going to provide you some data that the companies do and everything, and we do have several that we like to um, to uh, provide or have available for our patients. Um, but that's going to be very variable in terms of actually how much benefit you're going to get from them. But we do have some of those available too. But they're still the most common will be your sunscreen, sun protection, retin A, no matter what age. Okay, as long as you can tolerate it, and then those others after that. Um, could be rejuvenating, and then of course there's many other procedures. And if you talk with every way, there's go so um, you know mild peeling, and laser therapy, things like that that can rejuvenate the face. So quite a bit out there. <laughs> you have to probably set up a, a little evaluation if you're interested. Is it? As 
to, what has gotten women to actually do them? <laughs> <laughs> There's been research in terms of what's most helpful for women, and I think one of the things that they've found is working with somebody. Um, we have physical therapists uh, through the urology department and then our physical therapy department here who actually teach women how to Kegel. And I think that one's important because a lot of times women will say, I'm doing them for years, and then as part of my exam, I look and I test people to see how well they do it. And I'd say maybe about 50% are not using the right muscles at all. And so I think, you know, having that is good. Um, but the problem is, is once you're on your own, it is easy to forget. Um, so I think just the more benefit you see and the better you're at at them, you'll maybe see some benefit and it'll be worth your while to continue. If you're, if you're noticing that, yes, it's helping, um, you're going to be more likely to, to keep doing it. But I think if you have any doubts as to whether you're doing it right, um, having a referral to a physical therapist or one of our nurses is really helpful for that. Right now? Like, I mean, well, the way you would think about it um, is is if you're if you're if you're just trying to stop your stream of urine, um, those are the muscles you want to use. And a lot of women will lift up their entire buttocks. I do it on examining table when I test them. So if you squeeze my finger, but you're lifting up your entire buttocks, you're moving all of your body. You're, some people will actually valsalva or bear down when you're asking them to valsalva, and it's the exact opposite of that. Um, so those are the kinds of things you want to try to do. But we stopped sort of telling people to stop their stream of urine because you don't want to do it while you're urinating because that's actually going to put you in a bad pattern for urinating. But imagining it, if you're imagining it right now in your head, saying, okay, well, how would I stop my stream of urine, that, those are the muscles you want to use. Right. Yeah. I'm sure there is. And also they have all kinds of little weights, vaginal weights and things that aren't necessary, but some people use them for just to have that feedback to say, yes, I'm doing the right thing. Um, and the physical therapists use biofeedback. So they actually have little sensors that they can put on and you can actually see it on a little screen. Am I using the right muscles? How strong am I squeezing? And that helps you kind of figure out where those muscles are and how to use them.